Am I the first one to speak? Okay. I, first, I want to thank you, Pamela. Is this all right, the right level? Is this good? And Graham for inviting us in the speaker program. It's a very wonderful opportunity. I also want to thank Fran O'Neill for the invitation. Um, much appreciated your support, so thank you. And thank you likewise, and thank you to Andrea for asking me to join her. And um, I've known Andrea for many years, and it's been an ongoing conversation, and um, it's been a pleasure doing studio visits and going to see the Matisse show and talking about your work and my work, and uh, talking about abstraction yep. and its context. So thank you for coming. Um, as I was going through the slides late this afternoon, I realized that this is not just my work, it's about how a young artist develops and spends a life in the studio painting and how, um, how to feed abstraction. This was my very first painting and I did it to get into the school. I had been living in Europe in, on a Greek island and I saw the International Herald Tribune and there was a reproduction of a Philip Guston painting because he had just been at the Academy in Rome. And it was Painter's Table. And I looked at that painting and I thought, I've got I've to go back, you know. That was for me. And, but I really had very little experience. I went to the Art Students League. I drew. I took one painting class with Vaclav Vitlichel, who Mercedes Matter said was the John the Baptist of Hans Hoffman whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> and I painted one painting, and I was pretty proud of it. Um, it was inspired by a scene from Zabriskie's Point. This was 1970. Um, Zabriskie Point by Michelangelo Antonioni. It's uh, about three feet. And there are a couple of people here who might remember these paintings from when I did them at the studio school in 1974. They were among the last paintings I did as a student. I had spent most of the time here studying still lives. I never could really um, get attached to painting or drawing from the figure, much to some people's dismay. But I liked the small rooms with still lives. It was easier for me to work. And so a lot of the space and the construction in my work came from still life. You can break in any time. <laughs> well, I'll jump in and say that when I first saw your work, this was the work, these red and white ones, that I remember thinking abstraction had never really made sense to me. I liked it on some intuitive level, but I never really got it. And I remember seeing these slides um, and this was in 94, and you showed this slide, and I thought, wow, I, I suddenly got the physicality. I mean, just I think, you know, the, the paint cans gave, gave a sense of scale, and just being able to see what it meant to have that kind of rhythm and meter, um, all the musical terms that, you know, we think about in terms of lyrical abstraction suddenly made sense. And I think it's very, I think as a young painter, it was very hard to understand you said to me one time, I had made a painting, and I'll reveal that I'll Andrea, just to, to, this stays in this room in the video, <laughs> um, that Andrea was um, a very formative teacher of mine in undergrad, and was really my experience suddenly of experiencing a real New York artist, this fabled, uh, you know, kind of rare bird appeared all of a sudden, and she was tough as nails, and. Uh, I made an abstract painting and she came in and said, I'd made some huge painting, you know, in a night. And she said, well, that's not really coming out of anything real. And I knew she was totally right, but I also didn't understand what that meant. And so it's been really, you know, and when I saw this painting, I thought, okay, I see what that means. But it's been many years to figure out what a real abstraction looks like, as opposed to something, you know, anybody can get two colors and make a big splash. Um, but it is, it's, it's a very tricky thing, and I think it's very hard to put one's finger on it. So I, I asked Andrea to put this painting into the talk, because I, it, it was the first time I understood what it meant to make an abstract painting out of something real. 
I feel like that sums up that painting. <laughs> <laughs> then I moved to New York, 1980, and I had a smaller studio, and it changed my work quite a bit. Um, and initially, it was hard for me to find my voice in the 80s. Um, I was, the, for the first time, living in close proximity to galleries, to other artists. There was a very small community of us in Hoboken. Um, but this was the big wide world. And I tried many different things. I tried shape paintings. I used um, all different artifices. And this painting here is cut canvas, pasted on canvas, and then oil painted over. And by the time I got to the mid-80s, I realized that my subject was really going to be more about color and light. I'm jumping ahead. And th this was your first painting I remember actually seeing in person, and which jumps, back, uh, jumps to the 90s, or around this series of paintings. And it was precisely this loft scene this was another one of these sort of, you know, stages of understanding abstraction. As you're making these, I'm, I was sort of trying to figure out, and it, it was seeing the window, the scenes of Lower Manhattan, which at the time was not built up with, um, you know, beautiful sleek towers yet, and just seeing the view across the river or the view of the of the, you know, windows across the street through the window, and realizing that this was, even though you know it might pain some abstract painters to admit it. it, this was both an abstract painting and a fully figurative painting of a window at the same time. And you said something um, that has stuck with me, and I think this, we were looking at this painting um, at the time, and I should mention that after taking Andrea's class, I bugged her for years whenever I was near New York, and I would say, hey, I'm in New York, and I totally didn't realize how ridiculous this was. Uh, <laughs> can I come by your studio this afternoon? <laughs> Just out of the blue, um, and she politely, explain that she was busy and that she worked in daylight hours because the daylight was really important. And when I saw this painting, I really understood. And you said something that has stuck with me and I tell my students all the time, and I do it myself, which is that when you paint in strong light, the paintings tend to die down. And when you paint in low light, you overcompensate and the painting has a kind of inner light. And that was when you see those paintings. And you mentioned, I think, Rembrandt, the paintings of Rembrandt in the studio, that he chooses the darkest corner of the studio. And whenever I talk to people and they come, you know, to the to my studio or whatever, they're like, oh, what great light. You know, you've got this big window. And usually I try to explain that it's actually, you know, it's actually easier to paint behind the painting racks in the dark place, and the paintings come out better. Because um, everybody has this fantasy that the artist studio should have this amazing strong light. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was one of those things, I don't know, that something about the idea of painting in low light, making better paintings, seems to resonate beyond abstraction somehow. Well, because I only use natural light, and I think there are a few of us, I think I saw Judith Linares. <clears throat> She's another painter, very um, interested in color and light, and she also paints in natural light. And I can only see color spatially in natural light. I find that too much light um, artificial light flattens everything out. So when I think about light and color, I always think about it being in a place, in a space in the painting. Um, and because I paint in natural light, I'm very close to windows. You know, <laughs> I, um, <clears throat> and the format and the theme of windows kind of became internalized. You know, somebody came to my studio when I was on Harrison Street, and I had windows on both sides, and they said, you're painting your windows, looking out your windows. That's what your paintings are. And it, I was like, of course that's what I'm doing, you know. But the windows also um, became more literal at a certain point, and they uh, fed into my interest um, in film noir. And to support that interest, I went to Vienna for <clears throat> my sabbatical, a part of my sabbatical, several years ago. And um, I was very unhappy there. I felt very uncomfortable in my surroundings. 
and I spent most of the time inside in my apartment looking out the window. And I did a lot of watercolors of that. I would take photographs and um, do watercolors, both of portals. The one on the left is um, the doorway from one room to the other. And then the window is on the right. Well, I, I, was, I, t I joked to Andrea that I'm going to kind of bring in the context um, for these things. Because I think what's interesting about <clears throat> knowing you for so long is that the abstractions to me seem uh, just like poetry, where two words can actually be about something entirely different. Um, I think abstraction is like that. And I think when you came, I remember you coming back. We had a long talk after you, studio visit, after you came back from Vienna. and. You were preparing for the show at, I think, Mike Weiss, maybe? Um, and it was, it had been a really hard trip, and I remember it was a very dark time, and we talked about your father, who was an Austrian Jew, and going back and uh, finding that the houses that had been your grandmother's, you know, where your grandmother lived had been entirely obliterated, and that the houses next to those were still there. And, you know, I think one of the things that I find so interesting about the window series, and also, you know, I'm, th I'm thinking your experience describing uh, in v the unhappiness in Vienna and staying in the room reminds me a lot of, you know, another New York Jewish woman creator, Lynn Tillman, and I mentioned this in your hmm. studio, and I don't know if you guys have read Lynn Tillman, who's a great kind of downtown novelist, and she has these great s story collections and books. Um, she writes a lot about art, and, um, and she describes being stuck in this hotel room, but by, by choice. And for her, traveling means staying in the hotel room and for an hour going down to tea in the cafe at the hotel and then maybe going out to the corner and back. And the next day, maybe going out 45 minutes. And I think there is something about that experience, particularly combined with your family's history in Vienna, um, growing up with, I think, the I mean, that's a, that's a huge history of New York, is the immigrant experience. So many immigrants come to New York from trauma, whether they're Jewish or from other parts of the world. Um, and I think that's, that's become actually a New York, in a way I think that's what feeds the look of so much New York painting, is being in the city thinking of things like windows or portals to other spaces. And light and darkness become a subject beyond yeah. Yeah. Uh, just the visual. And certainly it was so in film noir. I mean, one can think about um, the narratives of film noir where you have somebody that's accused of a crime that they didn't commit. They don't even know what crime it was, and they're on the run, and they're, they're driving their car on a rainy night and looking through the rear view mirror. Somebody's chasing them. That I didn't do. But light coming at the end of a tunnel or after a long um, perspectival skewed space, um, that was something, and rain. There, there are many different veils of information visually that you can put in a painting. And I was doing it anyway, very unconsciously. Mm -hmm. And then when I became aware that the film noir directors were actually coming out of German expressionism. Yeah, and, and they were Austrians and Germans yeah. and Hungarians. Um, you know, your, I guess your family's name, Belag, is Hungarian. Yeah. Um, but they, they were coming from the same thing and they were yeah. refugees in the son of Hollywood filming psychological uh, yeah. Films, really, uh, with narr you know, through narrative. Not knowing that that's what they were doing. I think they. I don't. I don't know. Some of them. Were, I met the daughter of one of the um, filmmakers, um, Ed Edgar Ullman, uh, Ulmer or Ilman, um, and she said, "No, he didn't have anything to do with the Holocaust or refugees." And then she. And this was in a big. This was at a film festival. I asked a question. <laughs> she said, "No way." And then she thought, "But you know, we did have all these refugees because when they came to the United States, they would stay with us." So sometimes you adapt a language um, that is suitable. It's in the air. Yeah. And I think there was a film. I mean, just to bring it in with uh, one more thing, which is I think you've always used thin paint in a way that. You know, a lot of times thin paint makes a painting feel undernourished, and I think you, your paintings feel very well nourished. And I think one of the things that I um, always appreciate, and that I think is a connection to film, that film, literally your paint is a film. Your paint is a very thin film, and it, you know, it looks like almost a single still, um, you know, seeing through the kind of transparency of the pigment on the film. 
So there is, I think that's something that runs through, yeah. you know, the work since then. I, that may be an unconscious move or not, you know, things have meanings that you don't necessarily understand when you do them. But this painting had a lot to do with the empty spaces that I found in Vienna. And that's why it's very thinly painted, and so did this one. These were later, and I, you know, I did the photographs and watercolors in Vienna, and then I came back to New York, and I used them um, to, as a model for my oil paintings for a couple of years. I may have worked it into the ground, and then I left it, and then I came back to it, and um, there was less emotion on the surface, so I was able to do more things with it. But I should also add, and I think this is technically something I've always really admired is, and, and you know, having seen you last at the um, Matisse show, that the, the thinness of the paint doesn't come, it's, it comes from a long time working and reworking the paintings and erasing them. Um, and that's something that I've always kind of, in a way, tried to, emulate not always successfully and sometimes my paintings get very clotted with paint but I love that kind of Zen thing of wiping it down at the end of the day and coming back to it if it doesn't work. I remember you threw away a lot of paintings and I remember you saying oh yeah I threw away a bunch of paintings that didn't work and it just shocked me that you would throw them away. It's shocking. It was shocking. <laughs> well this one was very thinly painted because I did wash it out you can see that but then it was a color and it was a light and then I drew in in it, on it, and then scraped away the lines because it was too much paint for the light of the painting. So it was both fragile and very strong. This is the blue, my blue Vienna series, but it's taken to another, um, another level. And this was in my show in 2007 at Mike Weiss Gallery. This one's called Blue Chord. A little bit more recent. You can still see the embedded center of a space. Well, I remember seeing these paintings. Um, these were what, like 2000? This one is 2012. Yeah. Um, I remember seeing these paintings in your studio for the first time. And there was, it, there had been, there had been, you've been working on small drawings for a few years. Small paintings. Small, small paintings. And then all of a sudden, these huge paintings with these enormous brush marks and, you know, the whole body in it. Um, and of course, knowing that you do these in one, you know, one go. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm a huge Lois Dodd fan and I'm a huge fan of these kind of one-shot painters who it all happens and it's that Zen archery thing. You hit it or you don't. Yeah. And there was something that was so... Um, fresh in these and it seemed really uh, kind of reckless in the best way. That's good. I mean, I, I feel like I take chances with the paintings. There's no way that I can't. And they were very influenced by small paintings I was doing because um, for a couple of years my studio was being changed. I had to move and I had smaller spaces to work in. So you learn a lot. You, you work with whatever circumstances you have. But I think there's something about the fact that this painting is a big painting. I can't remember that it's, it is. it's, it's about, it's not maybe quite 56. as big as a screen, but yeah. it's big, it's 56 by 48. But it's treated, I mean, it's treated like a gouache. You know, the, I think the scale is what is really striking in a lot of these works, is that I think the, the same intensity that led you to throw out paintings, to me, struck me as saying, well, to, to have the bravado to treat a huge canvas with, as if it's a small gouache. Almost like it doesn't, it matters entirely, but it doesn't matter at all. And I think that's a really, um, something I'm always struck by with these big paintings, is that you come to them almost like they're, uh, with the confidence of a small gouache that could get thrown out. No I want go. them to be whole. I want them to be one piece. I don't want the parts of a painting to come apart. Mm -hmm. It's very important that they be whole. And Otherwise, they become too compositional. Mm -hmm. This is another idea of that hole and a space and a light. It's a little bit smaller. 
And this is the last one that I consciously did as a window. It's called Retrace. It's actually in a show now at Fordham University Gallery. Um, it's been shown a couple of times. And it's a combination of both the window and then the way of moving through the paint that has a very big stroke to it. I think what's, you know, one of the things that um, I bump up against as a critic all the time is that it's really hard to talk in words about good abstract painting. Mm. Um, I think there is a hook with figuration because there's things, you know, there's, is he painting a shop? Is it painting a backyard? You know, is there a figure? What are they doing? Um, and I think one of the things that is, uh, struck me about your work is the confidence in the language of almost the bodily language of paint um, and light. And I think that's something that is both a kind of stubbornness, and I think there is a stubbornness in your work, which is one of its strengths. Um, and it's also one of the sort of generosities of the work that in a way, when, when I come to it, it is a physical, visceral experience of feeling attended to by the painting. Um, in terms of a physical reaction. And I think that's a really rare experience that we are given, because um, so much of our interaction with, with the world is through words or things that are easily put into words. And I think that the physicality of these huge skins of paint, you know, these, these films of paint, um, the way that it all comes together at once is something that a colleague of mine was looking at your work today. You know, he'd seen the, the looking for, you know, thinking about this. And he said, wow, those paintings are really good. And I said, uh, yeah, they're really good. And it was hard to, and this is a very articulate guy, but it was very, it's very hard to say more than that sometimes because they, they're about light and about these physical uh, experiences that are very hard to, to put into language. That's, I think that's also why we end up talking about context and about the stories around these so much. That's all true. And I think what happens in abstract painting is that the subject matter or content gets moved to be the subject matter. So the paint and the color and the light and the space um, reveals an emotional tenor in the work, if I dare say that. Yeah. I mean, it's also funny because I think what's interesting is that you think that these paintings, they, they look, when I see, every time I see a new batch of paintings in the studio, they seem extremely present. They seem extremely, not dated, but they seem of a certain, like, oh wow, this seems very fresh right now. And it's interesting how with, they're not changing radical formal means, but somehow they're filtering the reality of today. You know, I mean, everybody talks about screens and whatever, and that's there, you know, there's no way to avoid it. Here we are looking at many screens. So should we look at yours? Sure. A little bit? Um, and I brought a few, we brought a few uh, images of, of recent drawings. Um, this is, this, this series grew out of, um, we're seeing this sort of, it's a little bit of a, of a jump, of a, of a dive into the deep end. This is from a series of drawings that began as, um, and I should mention that I was a, you know, trained mostly as a, landscape painter, um, very much influenced by probably a lot of the people that the studio school um, students I know look at, like Frank Auerbach and um, things like this. But I started making doodles in my studio to procrastinate, because um, going outside to paint every day is really hard and often very daunting, and just facing loading the car up or loading the bike is like often just a nightmare. Um, and so I started doodling in the studio sometimes, and uh, there were days, I will admit it, there were days where this drawing took up the whole day and I didn't make it outside. And then it became that I would wake up and be really excited to go doodle in the studio. And it was like a secret habit. And I thought, oh, geez. People would say, oh, you're going to the studio? Yep, going to go paint outside, hopefully. you know. And in my head, it was became like this weird alibi for going to make these doodles. And they started small. And, um, How you know, small? They were like half of eight and a half by 11. Like I would tear an eight and a half and 11 sheet in half. And then they started becoming eight and a half by 11. And, um, and they became, they were a lot about windows. And I think your windows, I was very influenced by the idea of windows and also architectural structures. And these became slowly got to be, there is a weird thing when your side 
furrow of plants that are kind of the weeds growing on the side become the thing in the studio. Yeah. And this is what happened, where these kind of took over. And these drawings became, um, I was looking at a lot of carpet, imagery of carpets, and I got a little bit obsessed with Persian carpets and kilims, and a friend of mine who's a textile designer kind of lent me extended loan of a lot of books about carpets. And I started looking at Russian textiles from the 19th century, and partly through that, that Hillary Sperling book about Matisse. I, you know, he was looking at a lot of Russian textiles, and I figure, well, why not? Why not do what he did? Um, and so the drawings became, in a way, um, in a, in a weird way, they were a way to slow down the abstract mark making process that would happen in paint. Because in paint, you could make some move in, you know, 20 seconds that would take a few hours in drawn and colored pencil. This is these are all the this drawing is 22 by 30, um, and so this came out of a long, these came out of a long process of being able to draw and erase, draw and erase, which was happening in the paintings and then started happening in the drawings uh, as well. This is called, um, the last one was called Mongols. This one is called, which has a lot to do with the carpets I was looking at. This one has, uh, is called um, Obstacle to, they have sort of long winded titles, so forgive me. This one is called Obstacle to the Perception of Change. Very literary. Um, very literary. It's actually the text, probably Russell knows, it's a text of a famous development economic um, essay. Um, but I got obsessed with, and um, I see one of my former students here, um, as she can attest, I got obsessed with negative space. And negative space became a symbol for so many things where I loved, speaking of film, I got interested in those films where and very few filmmakers do this, but man, it's great when they do it. When somebody who's kind of a side character in the background, you realize slowly through the film, is actually the protagonist, but you don't realize until a few minutes in. And I feel like so many things in life are like that, where somebody who's a side character, you realize later, is the protagonist or was the protagonist, and you kind of didn't realize it, but they actually are the positive space. So I, I think a lot of this work is about kind of making the positive and negative space, having space but having them always come back and forth and you're never quite on certain ground. And I think that also, I mean, I, we talked about screens and I know this is such a cliche by now, but it's just hard to avoid that there is something about flipping between tabs and windows and screens on a laptop that we have that experience that this document pops in front of that document, you know, on and off. And I think that's come into the language of the, of the drawings. I like how you described how you you were making these not thinking about making art. You know, art was loading up the car, doing these very high pressure, very beautiful plein air paintings, or your big abstract paintings, or your mid-size abstract paintings. But these came out of a much more informal um, urge to make mark, space, negative, positive, whatever. The embarrassing part of the story is that my parents, uh, split up in their 70s, and this is very personal. And, um, but that meant that my dad drove up with a trunk full of like old junk I really had no interest in from their house, because my mom moved to an apartment, he moved back to Argentina, and I thought, okay, what in the hell am I gonna do with this box of letters from camp? Like, things you really don't wanna look through. But, um, it was, yeah, this is the very embarrassing part. Um, but there was this box of uh, colored pencils that I had had, you know, and colored pencils don't go off. They stay good pretty much forever. And I thought, oh, you know, it's one of these studio assignments. I was a little bit stuck in the studio, and I thought, oh, I'll just work through this box. I've got colored pencils, and I've got a pretty good pencil sharpener, and I'm just going to draw until this box is done, and I'm not going to buy any, you know, it's one of those weird assignments you create in the studio to keep yourself going. Uh, or just to get out of a funk. I think I was in a funk at the time. This was maybe five years ago. And that, I started, and they were just terrible colored pencils. And so you would sharpen them and the lead would break and you would sharpen it. So you get like three marks and so they... So and, these, are these with them No, or not? so I the, finally, I got graduated. so sick of my stupid assignment and I got so hooked on these drawings, I started going to New York Central and buying the second cheapest pencils and then the third <laughs> cheapest pencil. And then before you knew it, I could only work with the really fancy German pencils and it's like a... <laughs> Fortune and pencils. Um, so now you're making art again. And now I'm yeah. And so now it's turned into art, and now I. Uh, you no, know. you know it's a real issue in painting to discover something, and then what do you do next? Do you try to make a series out of it? Do you really try to break it down, copy it? 
you know, and how do you preserve that moment of freshness and discovery that you have with your work? That's a big issue for me. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think I've always struggled, and I think this was something that I've actually struggled with in our, in, in having studied under you and then worked with you, is the, I think, the singular nature of your work, um, that there is a very clear through line in your work. And as I, I don't have that singular through line, and I've always, we've talked a lot about this, and I veer, I, I now um, have just said, I just explained to people, I have a schizophrenic studio practice. And nobody seems to mind, every New York, nobody seems to mind that. Um, but somehow having the label has helped people get around the fact that, you know, there's times when I do go out and paint, paint the landscape paintings or make the abstractions or now make the drawings. Um, and I think that's also a product of the age. I think partly what's being able to jump, um, jump from thing to thing is such a product of our contemporary existence. And I think coming up, it's so hard not to, th you know, I mean, I just, I'm always shocked when I have this experience of clicking from something incredibly tragic to something comedic to something silly on the internet and feeling weird about my clicks. Like, oh my God, how can I go from this to that? And so I think these drawings are in a large, in a, in a, in a kind of funny, goofy way. Um, and they also reveal my childhood. The, the other embarrassing part is that when I was a kid, my mom was an architect and I was obsessed with Memphis Milano, partly because of her and idol worship, but more importantly because of Miami Vice. Um, and it felt like that was the coolest thing in the world, was like drug dealers and, and Memphis Milano, you know, with Memphis Milano uh, inspired apartments. So I would do these, when I was like a kid, this is like a dorky thing, I would draw Memphis Milano furniture designs, which means like chair, which sounds really sophisticated, but it really means it was like, for those of you who lived through that period, you remember, these were like chairs with big green sunbursts and zigzags and polka dots and whatever. And with the child, when I got those childhood crayons, I thought, or car, uh, colored pencils, I thought, well, the last time I used these, I was making these goofy furniture designs, so I'm just going to do that, but without the structure of a chair, a table. And so these kind of grew out of my childhood obsession with Miami Vice, which is uh, I love le them. I less, love them. Yeah, they're, I like them too, but it's it's maybe less dignified than film noir, I think. <laughs> This I find looking at other artists it, very important to my work. And we all are influenced. It's sometimes best not to be influenced by your closest associates, but to discover an artist, this is not mine, this is by Hans Hartung. Um, and actually Edward Thorpe was in my studio and he he recommended, well, he thought that he saw a uh, similarity. And I really didn't know his work very well. There was a show not long ago at Chime Reed um, of his very late paintings, which I didn't think was that great. Um, but he told me of a show that um, Genseller had done, mm -hmm. is that her, Geldseller? In, oh, yeah. A long time ago, he, he wanted to introduce Hartung's work to New York and everyone like dumped it, you know, it was, it didn't go over well. But I got the catalog and I'm looking at these things and I think that they're really original. This is a guy who had a very fractured life going between, he was born in Germany, he was kind of forced out of the country, went to France, had a hard time there too. Um, but he's a real European uh, painter and I think he had a lot of influence over younger artists that are just coming now. And I really appreciated the sense of wholeness in the paintings. The gesture became something that was larger than the mark itself, which is something that's very appealing. I also was very interested in the work and very attracted to the work of Katarina Gross. Um, when I saw this, and this is her bedroom that she spray painted, I couldn't get over that, you know. <laughs> And I'm just trying to picture, does she go back to bed? Does she move <laughs> these things? What's in those boxes? I thought it was so fantastic because it's like you're living in color. You know, you can't get enough of it. I don't remember the year that this was shown, but I've been certain this says 2011. And then I had the good fortune to travel I'm showing you these things because they've been very important to me. 
These are two gardens <clears throat> in Kyoto. They're the Ryojin Inn gardens. The top one is Ishidan. And the second one, I don't think it really has a name. But there are common configurations in these gardens. They're done on a vertical horizontal principle where the vertical is the crane, horizontal is the tortoise. Both are symbols of longevity. If it's contained within a moss mound, that um, is a symbol of independence. Sometimes there's something very poetic going on with um, a rock formation um, will appear or was put there because they think it simulates running water ending in a pool on the bottom. Um, I found these things fantastic. Um, I found them both abstract and I'm not a Zen Buddhist and I don't um, read things symbolically, but visually I thought they were extraordinary. And this is the work of a young Japanese um, ceramic sculptor artist. His name is Takura Kuwata. He, I think, was born in the mid-80s, and he was born in Hiroshima. I wonder what that's like. Um, he doesn't speak any English, and even though I've met him and spent a little bit of time, it's, you can't have any kind of in-depth conversation. And he's also involved with gesture in a very complex way. He'll make something um, a very beautiful form and then stick a rock in it and then fire it and watch as it explodes. I mean, he doesn't watch it, but he's, he's hoping that things that are unexpected uh, will happen and create new forms. And he also uses these gorgeous glazes, metallic gold, bronze, platinum, and some of them are very highly uh, key color. Do you think the gaudiness is something that is part of the appeal, this mix of, because, you know, I think, you know, like, I think a lot of abstract artists look at Asian um, aesthetics and Asian philosophy quite intensively because I think it speaks so much to the experience of abstract painting of that moment of intensity that's just right, that's fully relaxed and fully present and, you know, that full emptiness that, that gets written about so much. I'm wondering though, what's interesting about his work is the kind of, the mix of this sort of explosion, the um, accidental, but also the gaudiness. And I'm wondering in your, maybe is a bigger question about your work because I think with the color and the lushness, and I'm thinking of like Linda Benglis who revels in, you know, gaudiness. I'm wondering whether that's something you, I think about it because I'm, Painting I from my, I'm thinking about Miami it. Vice. I mean, I'm yeah. always thinking about taste and, yeah. you know, kind of yeah. traveling outside of a certain taste structure. Um, and I'm curious about your gaudy. No, I, th I think that's absolutely true. I mean, I look at many things to add to a very basic vocabulary, which is French School of Paris painting or New York School. And I'll go to different cultures, different sources to add on to that. But the question of beauty and and cohesion is something that I think is constantly has to be questioned. And I'm willing to bring in things that um, are disturbing. I also wonder, I mean, it's interesting, you know, with Hiroshima, there's almost immediate, the guy doesn't have to do anything and there's immediate context, right? To whatever he makes, we would be like, oh my God, it's from Hiroshima, he's painted a tree. Um, so not to say it's not significant, but it's, um, I think there's certain factors and one thing, so there are certain factors and contextual factors that become important. And one thing that I has also been struck by in our conversations over the years, and maybe this connects to the gaudiness issue and the Linda Benglis, you know, uh, my own love of Linda Benglis's work, is we've talked about you being an abstract painter as a woman. And this is not something that I've, obviously I'm coming from a different perspective, but it's been really eye-opening to hear your relationship to that very thorny topic. I mean, the art world is, you know, thorny. very, very thorny and very, you know, for like, it's a, it's a very uh, male dominated world still, you know, um, and there's no, uh, but I, but you've really, I, I think it's been interesting to watch you sort of talk about things like beauty and your relationship to, you know, the issue, the, the, you were in feminist groups in the 70s and they didn't, um, and maybe we can switch to your, to your image. To um, my painting. Away from you. Um, but it, you know, we talked about this, how you were in feminist. No, feminists didn't like my work. They liked me, but <laughs> I, and I like them, 
But I made a decision to make my work separate from my politics. And it wasn't a popular decision with everybody. And they did not know, they thought my vocabulary was very uh, male dominated. And um, although the boys weren't exactly standing there waiting to accept me, believe me. <laughs> um, so I have, you know, colleagues, some of whom are here, and they're greatly appreciated, and a dialogue with a small group, and we go our own ways. You know, we make a life out of the work that um, w has some meaning to me, mm -hmm. that I can really get excited and wake up in the morning and want to do, even if it fails. Um, it was very isolating. I felt like I was rejected by this camp, not welcome in that camp. I mean, I wasn't in obscurity, but, um, and I think there are still a lot of issues, but you talk to people, successful people, about being a woman and being sidetracked um, or marginalized as an abstract painter, and you, you, there's not a whole lot of sympathy. Um, so I'm not looking for sympathy, it's just a matter of fact. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, it's, and it's, you know, we've seen in the last few years with Charlene von Heil and, you know, a lot of um, kind of women expert painter, there's almost been a, Amy Silman, um, there's been a kind of... But she broke up with abstraction, remember? Yeah. <laughs> but there, but I guess of like big gestural painting, um, there's been almost, I, feel, I think there's almost been, it's been interesting to see, you know, and I see your work as part of this trend of, of, women artists, women painters, and Amy's, you know, been painting a long time, um, and Charlene's been painting for a long time too, for that matter, of seeing them sort of assert, and I think, you know, Amy talks about it literally, of taking on board, um, or actually, sorry, Angela Dufresne says this, but um, taking on board, you know, she said, I, I was never accepted by the boys, so, or by the painting club, so why even play by the rules, and I'm just gonna paint whatever the hell I want. And I think there's something about the kind of large scale, beautiful, brash, uh, very physical, very painterly paintings that's been in, it's been a kind of wonderful renaissance to see in your show at DCKT in and in a lot of show, you know, the Amy Silman show in Boston yeah. a few years ago. Yeah. Um, it's been really exciting to watch but that happen. Frankly, and I love Amy Silman's work and I'm a big fan, but she would not have the career she has now if she wasn't also doing videos mm. and cartoons and a lot of other things to go along with it. Um, it's very hard to get a big audience for this one thing. Um, that's just the way it is. Yeah. Well, it's also, I mean, again, I said this earlier, but as a, it's, it's hard to write about it, and I think yes, that's a big... Yes, it is. Yes, it is. That's something that, as a critic, I'm very aware of, yeah. you know. Um, and you can see when people, it's hard, you know, even when I read other writers on abstraction, it's very hard to get somebody who can really say something interesting yeah. and original and actually capture the work in words because it's almost like the whole point is to speak in a language that's next to, aside from, you know, in the, in the house over from verbal language. And so it's like, how do you then translate this thing that is almost Well, Maya Shapiro thought you needed a parallel mm -hmm. poetic language. Yeah. This um, was also 2011, but the gesture, the physicality, the moving of colors that were already on the painting, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, but I think these were very influenced by um, what I saw. We went to Japan twice, seven years apart, and the restraint meant a lot to me, mm -hmm. and it really entered in. Because this is all on virgin surface. And these are big, this is 45 by They're 38. They're not that big. They're, they grew slowly. They're. <laughs> It's not small, it's not a, no, it's not a no, table size. No, Although I do paint everything horizontally, so they become a table. Mm -hmm. This is a pair. What, what's the paper? Mm -hmm. Is Donald saying what paper it is? No, it's not, it's not on paper. It's a, it, 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 I was saying the opposite, that it's actually, they're on big linen, oil on linen, um, that they're not on paper. And this and, was the show. And this was part of my show at DCKT this past June. Um, just to show you the scale, the painting on the right is uh, tracking Pocahontas, trying to get women's names into 
the titles at least. <laughs> but I, you know, my paintings aren't about figures, so it's very hard. So, but it's about moving. And then the three paintings in the middle, which really were one painting, because they all came from a common source. Um, I often look at something in my studio, whether it be my work or a photograph, or um, sometimes I, I have to not look and just absorb it and then go. Because looking at something makes a triangle. And it's much more dynamic to have a direct relationship with your painting. And the painting on the left is uh, Rubber Soul. Um, I think we have a couple more images, and as we're going through, I guess I'm curious, Andrea, because I, I, I loved your show at DCKT, and one thing I'm wondering about is to go back a long time to that comment about this abstraction isn't coming out of anything real. And I think that's a really valuable comment for anyone who's interested in abstract painting, to know, and I think, I felt, and it was it was very jarring and probably annoying at the time to hear, but a good thing. But I also knew it was a good thing to hear um, that to know that there is painting that, and you know it when you see it, when you make a good one. And I wonder if there's if we can even talk about what makes one of these things work or not. And I think that's a huge question, but it's also something that I think you've been working with for a long time. Yeah, it is. Um, I have certain criteria. One, it has to be something that is new to me. It has to be, there has to be a discovery in the painting. Mm -hmm. It has to be something I haven't seen before, which is tricky because then you can't always identify it. And sometimes, and the three paintings in the middle were actually done from a photograph of a painting I destroyed. Mm -hmm. And I was going through my old photographs and I realized, why did I destroy that one? <laughs> and so. I went back to the studio and I painted these three. Of course, none of them look like that painting, but I could tell that there was something real there. Mm -hmm. um, I was afraid that that painting looked too much like my older work, because I'm always trying to push my work into a less comfortable place. So that's important to me. Um, you know, I had this show, I had a very short period of time, like three weeks to, um, put it together, which wasn't an issue because I had a show in my studio. I hadn't shown for quite some time, seven years. And the year before, I was thinking, how am I going to you know, keep waking up and going to the studio, spending all this money, all my, all my passion on my work when there's no audience? And I thought, OK, I'm going to have an imaginary show. <laughs> so I thought, what would I do? What would my ideal show be? And I wanted them all the same size. So, you know, because that's what, you know, looks really powerful. <laughs> you walk in and they're all like one, damn, damn, damn. So I did that. I didn't get the show. Um, and actually half of them have hit the dust. The one on the right, Tracking Pocahontas, was one of the... And then I just got back to work. You know, somehow I tricked myself or I had group shows or I don't know what it was. In moments of desperation, you give yourself assignments and I, mm -hmm. I make up shows, you know. <laughs> um, what, how else do I know if something is good? You don't. You really don't. Um, it's very hard. I'm also, I, I'm ashamed to admit I need somebody else to help me see it. Okay. And it really does help. There are only a couple, of, I mean, I can't show them to my husband because he loves everything, you know. <laughs> but there are a couple of people that I trust, um, and we look at each other's work, and I value that opinion, even though it is so painful, you know. I'm the same way. I, I hope, I always hope to, um, you know the Susanna and the Bathers? I always mm -hmm. hope to see my paintings like Susanna, uh -huh. Like I'm sort of like like peeking in and I'll like forget right. that they're there and then right. oh my god there's a naked painting on the wall like right. and if it works it, and it hits me or it doesn't and that's um, no that's important yeah because actually I paint all the paintings horizontally I don't put them up immediately because I use very thin paint by the time I put them up I'm not in such a rush to turn around and look at it because right. I know. That could be the end, you know? And I want it to work, and I want it to be a painting, but I can't let that interfere with 
really seeing what I'm doing, which takes time. That's the other ingredient. And I think that's that's something about, you know, seeing your work over the years is just that even though these paintings are made so fast, I mean, it's that old Picasso line about, you know, it took me a minute to paint this and however many years to get to the point where I could do it so quickly. And I think, I do think that's very much in the work, that sense of confidence built up over a kind of accretion of practice. You can see in this one that there are some ghosts. I mean, I, I had to take down this painting six times before, because it, it was the biggest one that I had done in a long time at 70 inches tall, and now I love that size. But it was really, it was difficult. It was really a challenge. Um, so it's not as if I get one shot at a painting. And this is my other favorite size. It's 22 by 30. And I'm starting to work more with horizontals. Um, this comes right out of the gardens for me. And when I was a student here, Stephen Sloma was uh, my teacher, and uh, he had us read Zen in the Art of Archery. Yeah. It was indelible. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, because there is, you know, we were talking before about the hand and the way, I mean, I guess I'm looking at the time, and we should speed up, but the hand, um, the way you've kept your hand in the work, and I think a lot of your, a lot of the painters who work with gesture, there's some kind of, there's something between the hand and the paint. Um, spraying, or squeegeeing, or some kind of mechanical reproduction. And I find it noteworthy that there's still very much that presence of the, of yeah. the actual body in the making. And it feels, it feels in the work. I mean, there's, there's, an, there's a kind of powerful, when I see, one, well, this one, but I'm thinking of one that's coming up in a few slides, just the kind of, the movement, I, when I look at these paintings, I almost inevitably end up doing this or doing some kind of, in my head, doing some movement that seems very Everyone physical. else talks about the gesture, but it's not something that I really think about. <laughs> um, but obviously, If you did, it wouldn't be there, right? You know, um, mm -hmm. because it's a hard thing to um, sanctify, I guess, because it has such a loaded history, except that history was a long time ago. It's, it's time for different people to use the materials any which way they want. That's what I really think. This one is called um, Crane and Tortoise. I mean, it's funny because this, this work is work that a lot of young artists, I mean, since I, you know, like you, since I teach, I see a lot of young artists, I meet a lot of young artists. And this is work that um, a lot of young artists respond to. And it's work that a lot of young artists are also interested in doing. I'm thrilled to hear that. <laughs> I mean, I was invited into DCKT um, by very young artists when we went out for drinks after the first opening of a group show. Everyone got carded, you know. <laughs> I, I thought, now I've made it. <laughs> And I still work on small ones. These are on wood. I like working on wood because I can really, you know, sand them and really scrape them off. I've been using metallic paints. I don't know how obvious it is in the photographs, but I don't use white to create light or to dim color. So I use silver, which gives it a kind of a different kind of light that bounces a little bit off the surface. I've been doing that for a while. I don't always use it though. This is the one when I kept looking at online, and I think this was on the image for the talk, right? I think. Um, no. No. Oh, no. okay. I've just been looking at it, and I keep. This keep is the one like I that. keep. Yeah, this is a great. Well, having seen it a few weeks ago in your studio, it's such a great painting, and um, there is something. I mean, I think it's funny. I know this isn't necessarily what you're intended, but there isn't the reception. You know, you had the openings of the window, you had the, we, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the gesture, but there's also something very bodily in the way that these things are like appendages or holes or, you know, the, the, the kind of penetrability of the body. And I know that that's not at all intended to be there, but. It's not, I'm not totally unconscious of that. It's not something that I go after. What I do go after though is to have space. You know, is to have a recess, is to have things on more than one dimension mm -hmm. and a place for the color to be. 
That's very important to me. This is a big painting. These, the last, this one and the one prior were the two paintings that I felt strongest about since my show. And this one's gonna be in a show at Steve Kasher Gallery that celebrates 12 painters from the studio school. Um, since Christopher Wool had his retrospective at the Guggenheim, it's like we've all gotten together and kind of found different opportunities to show our work. And Steve Kasher invited six former students with some of our teachers and our teachers' teachers to be in the show. And that should be exciting. So that's the painting that I'm putting in that show. This is 60 by 70. Also something that you've been doing the last few years that I just want to mention because it's important is that you've been leaving a lot of white in your paintings. And I think that's something that maybe also adds to the sense of freshness, but also the kind of contemporaneity of it. Just that, you know, this great, when, you know, it's such a, it's such a formal canon of abstraction to do something like leave things white is both shocking and then to integrate that into the work. You say you don't add white, which feels sort of half true because it's like right. you, you use well, I don't the white. Add, I use you it, don't, right. I don't add it. Right. <laughs> Although in this one, I felt that there was too much white and I actually did something I almost never do and that I went into one of the corners, the upper right hand corner and I, I painted in something and gave it a little bit more depth. <laughs> we won't tell. You won't tell? It looks. And these, I'm just gonna quickly show you three images of something I'm working on now. It's a public art proposal. Um, hasn't been funded yet, so I'm not gonna talk too much about it, but it's, it's exciting to work in a very different uh, dimension. This one um, is a study for something that would be four by 12 and a half feet. Same thing with this. We're not supposed to take questions till later, so hold that thought. And then there's just one more. And now it's later. And now it's later. 